At Fermilab, we study nature at its most fundamental, drilling down to the smallest scales of matter using some of the largest and most advanced machines in the world. Accelerators, powerful microscopes, send particles barreling at near light speed into other matter, creating subatomic scraps. Detectors zoom in on those fleeting pieces, making the invisible perceptible. And sophisticated computers sweep through all of it, crushing mountains of information into gems of data. We also use our cutting edge technology to explore the mysteries of dark matter and the quantum realm. Thousands of scientists from around the world partner with Fermilab to explore how the universe works, expanding humanity's understanding of matter, energy, space, and time. Fermilab is solving the mysteries of the universe. Welcome everybody to the 2022 Fermilab Open House. And welcome also to this presentation of Simple Machines and the Amazing Powers that they give you. In this presentation, in, in this um, hour, we have two presenters. Uh, first, Steve Masters, who is a retired mechanical engineer and has been a um, education facilitator at Fermilab for the last five years. He's going to um, do a demo on Simple Machines. And then Anna Hall, who is a graduate student, um, a neutrino physicist from the University of Virginia, but working here at Fermilab. She is going to talk about the NOVA experiment, one of our big neutrino experiments um, at the lab, and show how symbol machines were used in the construction of that experiment. So take it away, Steve. Hi. My name is Steve, and today, as part of Fermilab's Open House, I want to talk to you about machines. Machines are everywhere. We see them and we use them all the time to accomplish tasks that we wouldn't be able to accomplish otherwise. Some machines are quite huge and complicated and difficult to understand. Things like an airplane, or a car, or even like Fermilab's accelerator complex, which is considered to be one of the largest machines in the world. So what I want to do today is take these complicated machines and break them down into their most basic components, something that we can understand, something called a simple machine. Now, the definition of a simple machine is a tool that uses one movement to complete work. And these simple machines allow us to complete that work by giving us what we call a mechanical advantage. Or in other words, they help us overcome the things that want to stop us from completing the work that we want to do. Things like gravity. Things like friction. Now there are six types of simple machines. There is a lever. There's an inclined plane. There's a wheel and axle. There's a screw. There's a wedge. And there's a pulley. And what I'm going to do today is talk about each one of them, explain what they are and how they work, and give examples of where we use them in our everyday life, even if we don't realize we're using them. And then I want to talk about how we can combine those simple machines so that they work in concert with each other to create more complicated machines. So the first simple machine that I want to talk about is the lever. The lever is defined as a bar which rests on a support to lift or move something. And I'm going to use a lever right now to lift a load. I've got this load right here. It weighs about 40 pounds, so it's kind of heavy. And I'm going to lift it using a lever. Now a lever consists of four main components. You have a bar, you have a support or a fulcrum, you have your load, and then the fourth component would be the force that I'm going to apply to lift that load. So I'm going to rest my bar on the fulcrum, and then if I apply a load here at the end of the bar, you can see I can lift that load. Now, interesting thing about the lever, right now I've got the support or the fulcrum right about midpoint between the load I'm lifting and where I'm applying the force. 
And without measuring, it feels like the force that I have to apply there is about the same as it took to lift that load in the first place. But if I move the support in so that now I've got more bar on my end, it gets a lot easier to lift that load. And in fact, if I move it all the way in, watch this, I can lift that load with one finger. I could never lift a 40 pound load with one finger without the help of a lever. Another example of a lever is the wrench. You probably have wrenches around your house. Here I've got this screw in a piece of wood and there's no way that I can turn this with my fingers to loosen that screw. And even if I could, it would hurt my fingers. But if I take this wrench, use it maybe, using it as a lever, I can very easily turn that screw and get it to the point where it's loose and I can get it out. And speaking of levers, I'm lifting this piece of wood up and down. What's acting as a lever? My arm is acting as a lever. In fact, my body is full of levers. Everything I do getting around, every action I take pretty much, is using one part of my body or another as a lever. A teeter-totter is a lever, even if it's a bee. Come to think of it, a bee's wing is a lever too. Interesting fact about levers, they were first described and studied by an ancient Greek scientist named Archimedes. And Archimedes was quoted as saying, give me a lever long enough and I can move the earth. Now, he also thought the earth was flat, but you can still understand the point that he was trying to make. The next simple machine that I want to talk about is the inclined plane. The definition of an inclined plane is a flat surface like this that connects a lower level to a higher level. So I have an inclined plane set up here and you see I can roll all kinds of stuff down there. Here's a couple balls. Here's my sleeping bag. Not too exciting, huh? In fact, the inclined plane is probably the least obvious, most boring of all the simple machines. We tend not to even think of it as a machine because it doesn't have any moving parts. It's just kind of there, part of the landscape. But it is a machine, and it is no less important than any of the others. A slide is an inclined plane. Even a stairway or a ladder is an inclined plane. It's not a flat plane, so to speak, but a series of them arranged in an incline to enable us to go up and down. Inclined planes can help cars cross rivers. Hikers and bikers to get up steep hills. And wheelchairs to access buildings that they wouldn't be able to otherwise. Do you like sledding? Try doing it without an inclined plane. So far we've talked about the lever and the inclined plane. Two simple machines that give us our mechanical advantage by allowing us to counteract the effects of gravity or at least control them to our advantage. Now I want to talk about a simple machine which gives us a mechanical advantage by reducing friction. And that would be the wheel and axle. Now there's several inventions that have revolutionized the course of history, but the wheel and axle is certainly one of the top ones of all time. And the definition of a wheel and axle is really pretty simple. It's two objects, usually round or roundish, which are joined at the center. Now the way that a wheel and axle works is it takes what would normally be sliding friction and instead gives us rolling friction. And rolling friction is quite a bit less than sliding friction. So you see I have this toy car here and I've taped the wheels so they can't spin. And so you see, if I apply a force to it, you know, it's gonna take pretty good force to get it to go all the way across the table. But if I take the tape off the wheels, you'll see that it takes very little force to get it to go all the way across the table. So watch this. Hey, we don't have brakes, help! 
Now, I know you're all familiar with wheels. They're on your toys. They're on your bike. You see them on cars. You see them on trains. They're even on airplanes to help them to get out to the runway and back. But wheels help us not only by getting from one point to another, but they also allow us to move heavy loads, loads that are much heavier than we'd be able to move otherwise from one point to another, as you can see here. And wheels are not just for moving things around. There are lots and lots of uses for wheels. I'll show you one. You can see here I've made this delicious pizza, and I am going to use this pizza cutter, which is a wheel, to slice it. Yum! Wheels show up in lots of things that you don't think of as wheels. Even a doorknob is a type of wheel. Hey, get out of here! Oops. Well, maybe when we're done, you can look around your house and see what wheels you can find. So far, we've talked about the three primary types of simple machines. We've talked about the lever, we've talked about the inclined plane, and we've talked about the wheel. The next three types of simple machines, in many ways, are variations on the first three. In fact, sometimes they're not even included in discussions about simple machines. But because their functions are so unique, and because this is my video, I'm going to talk about it. So the first one I want to talk about is the screw. We're all familiar with screws. There's screws all over your house. What simple machine do you think that the screw is a variation of? I'll give you a couple seconds to think about it. Did you come up with anything? The screw is actually a variation on the inclined plane. Hard to visualize? Well, imagine, if you will, a long, skinny inclined plane that's straight. And then you take that and wind it around and around and around, and you have a screw. And what the screw does then is that when I turn it in a circular motion, and I'm going to do that using a lever, by the way, when I turn it in a circular motion, it gives me movement in the direction along the shaft. So you can see as I'm turning this in a circular motion, the screw is headed that direction. Still having trouble visualizing how a screw is basically a wound up inclined plane, perhaps this slide makes it easier to see. Imagine we start with a long straight slide and then we wind it round and round. Now we have a slide that's a screw. And even though the kids are going round and round, their general direction is down along the shaft of the screw. The first screw begins with our buddy Archimedes in about 250 BCE. But he didn't invent a metal fastener type screw like this. He invented a screw to pump water. Now imagine, if you will, a screw like this and you place it inside a hollow tube where it fits fairly snugly and then the bottom of it is submerged in water. So now when you turn the screw, the water is trapped between the threads and the sides of the tube and it moves up. And so he designed a screw type pump to move water up and move it to fields where he could irrigate the fields. The screw type pump that he designed is still used in many pretty amazing applications or at least the concept of it is. For example, there's a small screw type pump which is used in open heart surgery to move blood through your body while they're working on your heart. There's large screw type pumps used at SeaWorld to move water around. And we have screw type pumps at Fermilab in our deep underground experimental areas to pump water out and keep them from flooding. Now, if you're like me, <clears throat> you tend to, you hear the word screw and you think metal fastener. But there's lots and lots of other places where screws are used. For example, we screw in a light bulb with threads on the bottom of the bulb. We unscrew the lid of a jar and screw it back on to seal it. In fact, if you use the expression, screw something in or unscrew something, you're probably using a screw. Screws are also used for accurate positioning. For example, I have this um, adjustable wrench here, and by turning this screw, I can adjust the size of the wrench to whatever I want. 
or I have this C-clamp here. And again, by turning this screw, I can adjust the size of the clamp and I can even use it using this lever, by the way, to clamp this piece of wood. Next, I want to talk about the wedge. Now, the definition of a wedge is a machine that has one or two sloping sides ending in a point. It can be used to either lift or split something, and it can be used to either move something or stop it from moving. So the classic wedge is the head of this hatchet here. You can see it has two sloping sides, so we call this a double wedge, that end in a sharp point. And so we can use this hatchet for splitting wood. Now, since I'm not allowed to split wood in the house, watch this guy do it for a second. A knife is also a wedge. It's similar in design to the hatchet in that it has two sloping sides that come to a sharp point. It's just skinnier. So watch me as I use this wedge, this knife, to cut this apple. You see it separated the sides, cut through it, and then separated it. So now watch me as I use my own personal wedges, my teeth, to take a bite of this apple. Hmm. Now wedges come in a lot of different shapes. For example, this chisel is a wedge. This is a machine or a tool which is used to chip away at either wood or metal or stone. Sculpture, sculptures would use a chisel to create interesting shapes. A nail is also a wedge. It's different in that it doesn't have defined sides, it's round, but it still works on the same principle, is that as you hammer it down into the wood, it's pushing the wood aside as it passes down through there. Another example of a wedge that you might see, which is much bigger, is a snowplow. A doorstop is an example of a wedge that rather than being used to move something, is used to stop it. This is a one-sided wedge, and the way you use it is you just wedge it in there. And again, if you're using the term just wedge it in there, you're probably using a wedge. Hey, let me out of here! So did you guys figure out which other simple machine the wedge is a variation of? Well, it's a variation of an inclined plane. You see here, we have one inclined plane here. This hatchet has two inclined planes that are on opposite sides to each other. So just like the screw, the wedge is a variation of that inclined plane. So we have one other simple machine that we need to talk about yet. The last simple machine that I want to talk about is the pulley. And the pulley is a variation on the wheel. Now the definition of the pulley is that it's a wheel with grooves and a rope through it. And you can lift and lower loads easily by pulling on the rope. Now the first pulleys probably were not wheels. It probably was just a tree branch with a rope tossed over it. And then you could, by pulling on the rope, again, you could lift your load. Now one thing you can see about this pulley is that, it, and not all pulleys do this, but it changes the direction of the load. So in other words, if I want to lift my load up, I can lift it by pulling down. And pulling down is easier than pulling up because imagine if this tree branch was way up high and I had a load I wanted to lift, I could get down and I could you know, pull down and get my whole body weight into it, making it easier to lift that load. So I have a pulley system here and we're gonna take some data. Here's a single pulley fixed to this bar here. I have a four and a half kilogram load down here. I have a scale so I can measure the force that I'm using to lift that load. And I have a bar here which is set 16 centimeters over the ground. That way it's just a set distance to use for comparison to raise that load. So if I put my scale on here and I lift this load, I can see that I'm using four and a half kilograms force to lift that load. Pretty simple and obvious. And um, if I lift the load 16 centimeters, I think you can figure out that I'm 
moving the rope or using 16 centimeters of rope to lift that load. Again, pretty obvious. Now, you might say, well, that didn't make it any easier. But again, if this was up high and I was pulling down, I could get my body weight into it. And it may seem awful obvious that I used 16 centimeters of rope to lift that thing 16 centimeters, but you'll see why I bring that up in a minute. There's variations I can make to my pulley system to make lifting that load even easier. Rather than having a fixed pulley with the pulley up here, I've connected it to my load, and when I pull the rope, it moves along with my load. So I have a movable pulley. So let's see now how much force it takes to lift this four and a half kilogram load. Huh, it takes two and a quarter kilograms to lift that load now, exactly half. So what happened? Was it magic? Did this thing suddenly get lighter? Or is there some kind of a trade-off? Well, let's see how much distance, how much rope I have to pull to lift that 16 centimeters. So I have a, a yardstick here. It's kind of crude, but it'll get us there. So I'm starting at about here. I lift that. It's about 16 centimeters. And I have to use 32 centimeters of rope to lift my load 16 centimeters. So double the length of rope to lift my load. So in actuality, I've done the same amount of work. It's just that it seems easier to me because I would rather lift a lighter load. The difference between 16 and 32 centimeters of rope, I didn't even notice, but the load is lighter. Now we can even take this one step further. So now I've created a compound pulley. I've added another pulley to my pulley system. So now the rope is anchored here on the bar. It goes down through one of these pulleys, up around this pulley, down through another one of these pulleys, up to me where I'm going to apply a force. So let's see how much force it takes now to lift my four and a half kilogram load. It takes one and a half kilograms. So how much length of rope do you think it's going to, I'm going to need to lift it 16 centimeters? Well, again, this is going to be a pretty crude measurement, but let's see. I've got my yardstick on the floor there now. Um, I'm starting with the rope right at the top of this bar. So let's lift my 16 centimeters. So here's how much rope I used. Let's see what length it is. Looks like about 48 centimeters, three times the length of rope. So I, the load that it takes to lift that is one third of what the original load is. And the length of rope that I need to use to lift it a fixed distance is three times. So do you see a pattern here? Again, I'm still doing the same amount of work, but it seems even easier. Now I could keep adding pulleys to that, Eventually, it's going to take so much rope that that won't be practical to do so. I, I'll want to find what the optimum number of pulleys is to make that easy to lift. Now, there's other applications for pulleys that you probably have seen. Uh, for example, uh, the flagpole at your school probably uses a pulley. You may have seen a pulley on the back of a tow truck. Or you may have seen a pulley on a crane. Pulleys are the simple machine of choice for cartoon villains who want to lift heavy loads like a safe or a piano and drop it on their nemesis. So watch Wile E. Coyote try to do that in this clip. Before we go, I said that we would talk about how simple machines are combined together to work in concert with each other and perform even more complicated tasks. So let me give you a few examples of that. So we already talked about this knife, and we talked about how the knife blade was a wedge. But when I use this knife to cut, I'm also using the handle as a lever. 
So the knife is actually a wedge lever combination. Now what do you think I get if I take two of these wedge lever combinations and connect them together? Well, I get some scissors. Here's another one. <clears throat> so I'm in the middle of making this hamburger, or maybe it's a pancake, it's kind of hard to tell. And I have this spatula. How many simple machines do you think I can squeeze out of the spatula? Well, if I hold it at an angle and push it to lift my burger pancake up, I've used it as a wedge. If I hold it at an angle and let my burger pancake slide back off, it's an inclined plane. And if I flip it, it's a lever. And all the while, the handle of this thing is a lever. So three simple machines squeezed out of this one little plastic thing from the dollar store that doesn't even have any moving parts. Now let's get a little bit more complicated. So here's my bike. The simple machines are there. Well, I just flip down the kickstand, which is a lever, and actually inside there, there's a wedge holding the kickstand in place. There's the two wheels, which are probably the most obvious simple machines on this thing, but this is also a wheel, the pedal. Uh, what else we got? Well, we got um, the chain and sprocket combo down there is a pulley. The handlebars are levers. The brake levers are levers. The brakes are levers. If you take apart, the, if you've ever taken apart the handlebar assembly, you see that inside here there are two wedges which slide against each other and set the height of the handlebars. And I'm sure if we took more time, we could find all kinds more simple machines on my bike. But I want to show you one more, and that's a pretty simple thing, but I think it's kind of cool. It's the can opener. So the can opener has two levers, and if I squeeze these levers, it applies, allows this wedge right here, which is also a wheel, it applies enough force on it to allow it to pierce the can. And then, when I turn these levers, it turns that wedge wheel, as well as a couple other wheels, which rotate the can, and cause that wedge to go all the way around and open the can. Here's a fun fact about the can opener. Canned food was introduced in 1809, but the can opener wasn't invented until 1858. So for almost 50 years, how do you think they opened cans? Well, that's something I want you to think about. If you had opened a can and you didn't have a can opener, how would you open it? And what simple machine would you be using to do that? Well, I want to say one other thing, and that's that if you find it interesting or kind of cool or kind of fun to dig into all these machines and analyze them and figure out what simple machines are operating there, you may be cut out to be an engineer or a physicist. Now, notice I didn't say if you got it all figured out you may be cut out to be an engineer or a physicist. Figuring it out is something you can learn. But if you have the interest and you think it's kind of cool, that's something to consider in the future. So I want to thank you all for listening, and I want you to enjoy going out there and using all the simple machines you can. Pay attention to them. Thanks. We're going to move straight into the um, next presentation by Anna, and then um, we will be collecting questions. Uh, if you want to put your questions in the chat, um, feel free. And then once Anna has told us about Nova and the simple machines that uh, were used in building Nova, we will have some time for questions. Yeah, hey everybody. Um, so yeah, I'm Anna and I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about how we use simple machines to build NOVA, which is one of the big experiments here at Fermilab. So really fast, NOVA is an experiment that studies these tiny, 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 tiny little particles called neutrinos. And to do that, we use two really big detectors um, to see what happens when neutrinos go through them. So 
what is a neutrino? So they're really small, small particles, and um, they are everywhere in the universe. They're flying around right now all around us. Um, and they're so small and they go so fast that they can go right through pretty much everything without touching a thing. They're smaller than the atoms that make up you and me. So they can go right through us and not touch anything. And because they're so, they don't like interacting with stuff, they don't like bumping into things, they makes it really hard for us to see them and detect them to study them. So because of that, what we need to do is we need to build very specific kinds of detectors and they need to be big so that we can see as many neutrinos as we can. If you think about it, have you ever tried running through a room? And if there's only a couple people, it's really easy to miss the people and go straight through the room. But if the room's really full of people, it's really hard to run through the room without running into something. So that's kind of what we're doing here. If we build these really big detectors, there's a lot more for the neutrinos to run into so that maybe we can see them. So we have two detectors that we use, and one of them's our near detector, and it's located here at Fermilab, about 100 meters underground. And you can see, you can use these people here for size, that it's about two people tall-ish. You can see I'm right here, so you can kind of gauge the size of it to me. And uh, you can see it goes back quite a way, so it's a kind of a long detector. You can think of it as just a big box, right? So it's a pretty good size detector. But when you compare it to our far detector, which is all the way in Minnesota, this guy is huge. So you can see the people down here for reference, instead of the detector being about two people tall, this is about six or seven people tall. And it goes back really long. It's much longer than our other detector. And again, we need these really big detectors so that we can have a chance to see these tiny, tiny particles that we're sending through it. So let's talk a little bit more about what makes up these detectors. So here you can kind of compare the sizes of our near detector, that's the one underground, to our far detector, which is the one in Minnesota. If we zoom in there, we can see what they're made up of. They're made up of a bunch of straws, really. They're these long tubes, and we stack them up in layers. So the first layer has all the tubes standing upright, and then the next layer has all of the tubes laying on top of each other, and then the next one has them all standing upright, and then laying on top of each other, and so on. Um, so you can kind of think of this as if you ever play with Lincoln Logs, you can stack up the Lincoln Logs, sometimes you can stand them upright. You do the same thing, these are really big tubes. And then we glue them all together so they stay together, and we fill them with a special oil that lights up when a, a charged particle goes through it. And those, that light gets collected up in our detector, and then after a bunch of processing, we can see them on a screen kind of like this down here at the bottom. All these colored lines are a particle that went through our detector. In this case, they're mostly muons, but you, the, you, know, you can still see how the detector works. But you guys came here to talk about, learn about simple machines. So what I wanted to talk about was how we used simple machines to build these two cool detectors. So let's start with our near detector. This one's the smaller one, but it's underground and it's, you know, can be kind of hard to build things underground sometimes. So what we did is instead of trying to build the whole thing and then put it underground, we built it in little pieces and then we brought the pieces underground. So here we have a piece of the detector and here you can see kind of the layers. We have a layer of the straws all laying down and then a layer of them standing up and laying down and standing up and so on. And so here's one piece of the detector and we can see here that we had it, we put it in a frame and then we could frame, connected the frame up to this big yellow thing. If you look really closely here where my mouse is, you can kind of see this wheel with some string hanging off of it. That hopefully reminds you of the pulleys that Steve just showed us. So, and that it indeed is a pulley. You can see it a little bit better in this big picture. So once we've attached the piece of the detector to this string here, it goes up, or cable, and it goes up into this pulley. And this whole yellow thing is the pulley, and it's really cool. It's about the size of a giant, so this is a giant warehouse and it's really big. And this pulley here can get moved back and forth along this yellow part. And so it's on wheels. You can kind of see wheels right there, which are another simple machine. So it can get moved back and forth this way. These yellow bars are on wheels over here. So these can move back and forth along the building. And then of course the pulley can raise whatever it's carrying up and down as well. So that's a lot of simple machines working together to be able to move really big, heavy objects around this building. So down here at the bottom, you can kind of also see we've got the beginning of a hole in the ground. And that's how we got 
and that's the hole in the ground that we use to put things into our underground area. So I'm going to flip through some pictures here and you kind of just kind of see this piece of detector move down through the hole to our underground area using the pulley. So now the pulley starts lowering it down. You can still see the cables here, lowering it down into this hole. And it goes down until it reached our underground area. And once it reached our underground area, we put it on this platform with some wheel and axles. So remember, Steve said that um, using wheel and axles can help us move really heavy objects with less force than it would be to carry them. So that's what we're doing here. So once we've got it on the platform, we use the pulley to raise the kind of uh, crane or cage that we put around it back up so it can move the next piece in. So, however, at the bottom of the shaft that we just lowered this piece of the detector in, that's not where the detector stayed. So now we need to move it into place. So you can see down here, here's the wheels for the platform. So that's one of the simple machines we use. And then the other thing we use is this forklift. And these forklifts are a great combination of a couple uh, different simple machines. We of course have the wheels, but the big, the most important part of the forklift is the actual forklift part of it. So here you can't see it because it's wedged underneath the part of the detector, but if you've ever seen a forklift, you know it has this bit that sticks out here. And like I just said, it's wedged underneath the detector. So it's that's a simple machine right there. It's a wedge. So it wedges under the detector so that when the um, forklift moves forward, it also will push the part of the detector forward. And so we do that and it gets moved into place, it gets set down and we repeat it with the next one until the whole detector was put together. So same, we did more or less the same thing for the far detector, except since it's so big as you guys can see here, we couldn't really use just a forklift to move all the pieces in spot in place. So we had to come up with something else. If you give me a second, I'm going to switch over to some videos and we'll actually watch some videos of how we did it. So here we can see this is a big pivoter table, which I'll talk more about in a second. And when I play the video, you see they'll start, put, they're laying down all the straws and layers down here. So I want you to pay attention. So here, this white things are the layers of straws that they're putting down. And the black bit that you kind of see is coming across is them going layer by layer. And if you look really carefully, I can try to pause it. There we go. You see this big yellow thing coming across? That looks really familiar. And here's, we've got some cables going up. This is the same kind of pulley as what we saw when we were building the near detector. So this pulley is coming in and it's placing down different bits of straws and we'll do layer by layer. So that pulley has been really useful, simple machine in building these detectors. So go layer by layer, we keep building it up onto this table. And we're gluing it all down at the same time as we go. And once we've got enough, a big chunk of it built up, and again, remember, these are really, really big, so we can't just use a forklift to move it into place. So once it's built up enough, now we've got all piece glued to, oh, look, it started moving. So this table, we call it a pivoter table, and it's got wheels down here to move, and you can see it's pulling in on the end, and it's standing this whole thing up straight. So here, since we're pulling in on one end of something and it's lifting up the other side, that's a lever, like Steve taught us. So it's a big, we call it a pivoter table, but it's really just one really big lever with on wheels. So we've got the wheels to help move it in place, and then we use it as a lever to pull it in. So we're gonna look a little closer into that pivoter table. So here's a prototype that we built just to make sure that it would work. So it's a little bit smaller, but it's the same idea. So here we've got the table part of it. So it's this long bit. This is the bit that's gonna be the lever. And we build up part of the detector on it. And then the silver part here is the bit that's pulling on one end of the lever. So remember the video where Steve was pushing on one end of a lever to lift up weight on the other end? This, you can kind of think of the silver bit pulling in on this end as Steve pushing down on that lever to lift up the other end. So let's see what that happens there. Okay, so we pull in on this end and it lifts up the other side and it stands at the detector. And then the wheels push it forward into place. We can set it down. So again, you can see that here's a person way down here. So we can see we did this so that we could move these really big straws into place to make the detector. 
All right, so I'm just going to play this a little bit more and we can see a little bit more on how we lay down all of those straws and see if you keep your eyes out and see if you can spot some more simple machines. So of course we have our pulley system up here again. You can't see the pulley, but we can see that it's on cables moving it around. So what we're doing here is we're using some suction to pick up this layer of straws. We're using the pulley to move it around. And you guys, these guys with the ropes here, kind of putting it in place, those ropes are acting as levers to kind of move this around as need to. So right here, what they're doing is they're using a special, so they're um, putting the straws down and they're using a special spraying machine to spray some a layer of glue on there so that all the straws will actually stick together. Now, the sprayer thing is kind of cool because to do that, we have to pump glue from these barrels out through the nozzle. And remember what Steve was talking about? A pump uses a screw, which is a simple machine to move liquid. So here we're using a really, you know, we're using a very special screw system to be able to pump this glue out. So now we've glued it together. We use the pulley to raise it back up. Yep. And then we're using the ropes as lovers to kind of move things and, you know, move things around as need be. We're placing it down. And we're being very precise to make sure everything's lined up correctly. And it's released and we move on to the next one. So of course, some of the other simple machines that we use that we I didn't get pictured here is of course, moving all these materials from place to another. We had to use things like trucks and we use loading docks, which are inclined planes to be able to get up onto, uh, move the materials into the various places. And um, you know all of these machines, you can imagine there's gears in them, which are kind of combinations of wheels and axles and inclined planes and wedges. Um, so we really used a lot of simple machines to be able to build these really big detectors to do this really cool science. And the coolest part, in my opinion, is that these same simple machines are the same ones that you use every day. And it's kind of a cool way to show that all of the big fancy science that you see going on isn't all that different than you know, things that you can do in your house right now. So, yeah, so that's how we use simple machines to build Nova. Thank you, Anna, that was great. <clears throat> I'm not seeing any questions yet. Um, do any of you have questions that you could put in the chat? Or you can raise your hand if, if you know how to raise your hand in Zoom. No questions? Anna, um, how did you become a scientist? Well, um, in school and growing up, I was always um, interested in how things worked and, you know, trying to figure out how to make things work better, kind of like what Steve was talking about at the end of his video. And um, I took some physics classes in high school and I was like, this is it. This is what I want to do. I really enjoy figuring out how things work and studying it. And here I am. <laughs> and maybe let's ask Steve the, the similar question. Um, what brought you into mechanical engineering? Pretty much the same answer. I always enjoyed tinkering with things and trying to figure out how they work, taking them apart, trying to put them back together. So when I went to college, I majored in mechanical engineering and worked as a mechanical engineer for about 30 years. Uh, how long did it take to build Nova, Anna? Um, you know, I was actually recently looking all this up. Um, it took a long time to build all of the different pieces and then actually putting them all together took a long time too. So overall, I think it took about four to five years, um, but the actual construction part of like getting all the pieces put together in the, to make the, you know, the bits like I just showed you, that took about a year and a half to two years. Yeah, there had to be a, a tremendous amount of planning and design work that went into it before they could even start doing anything physical. You know, you can't just throw something like that together. Yeah, yeah. So um, Kalani asks, what opportunities for a physics graduate student are you providing? At Fermilab? I guess, yeah, what are opportunities for a physics graduate student? 
I guess so, I can yeah. answer that. So she's a physics graduate. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. So um, being able to work come out here and work at Fermilab has meant I've been able to work on um, some of the biggest neutrino experiments in the world. Um, and it's been really great because then I can, you know, connect with a lot of other scientists from around the world since it's an international lab. Um, and uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's just been a great place to come and like learn how to do science, not just learn what's, you know, it's been a great way to learn how science works and how we do science and not just learning the formulas and learning the things that you get out of the textbook. Well, uh, can I add something to that? Sure. You know, I've read an article, a degree in physics is one of the, if not the most versatile degree there is. In other words, if you have a degree in physics, you can't imagine all the different job titles that people would be interested in hiring you for. And, and I'll give you an example is that I was talking to a guy one time at Fermilab and he was about four or five weeks away from getting his PhD. And he already had a job lined up with Lehman Brothers on Wall Street in New York. And I'm like, why? You know, why are you, you know, leaving science and going to work for Lehman Brothers? And it's because one of the things that physicists are really great at and learn is handling massive amounts of data. And that applies not just to science, but it applies to economics. And you know, a company like Lehman Brothers is really interested in analyzing massive amounts of data. So physics is really a very, very versatile degree to have even if you don't want to stay in science. I've, I've heard a lot that getting a degree in physics or learning about physics is more about learning how to problem solve than it is necessarily about learning about gravity or you know, how things work. It's more about learning how to solve problems and learning how to find out new information about things. So. And the same would apply to engineering, you know, yes. all the disciplines of engineering as well. So we have time for just a couple more questions. Um, um, one was, uh, some, um, Satsham asks, do you have any advice for becoming better at math? I, I can answer that from my experience anyway. Um, I know I used to struggle at math, fractions in particular. When I learned fractions, it was a pain. Um, until someone told me to look at it, instead of trying to learn a bunch of rules that you have to apply to numbers, and you just have to learn how to do it over and over. Um, look at it more of is a puzzle. If you look at the numbers more of as like, I'm trying to figure out how to make these puzzle pieces work together to find the answer I need. Um, it For me, that helped anyway, because it was less about learning the rules and applying the rules in the correct way. It was more about looking at the relationships between the numbers and trying to see patterns and things like that for myself. Um, so that's just what helped me. I don't know if that'll help everybody, but. People, I remember when I was a kid, you know, I hated word problems. I hated word problems, you know, and and you always wondered, you know, why do I have to learn this stuff? When am I ever going to use any of it? But it's amazing, even if you're not a scientist, just, you know, in everyday life, dealing with money in your checkbook and dealing with, you know, say if you want to build something and making measurements, you know, you use it. And it really... You may be just doing it in your head, but you're doing word problem. So I would say just practice too, you know? I mean, you may hate homework because you keep doing similar problems over and over again, but that's how you're gonna get good at it. Um, and a quick, um, a couple of quick, let's see. There was, uh, what is the most interesting mechanical engineering project you've worked on, Steve? And if you could take that fairly quickly. And then um, I wanna also say seven-year-old Allison asks, could human body parts be considered simple machines? And maybe you can take both of those. Okay, well, well, the easier one is, yes, human body parts can definitely be considered simple machines. And I talked a little bit about that in the video, like my teeth are wedges, you know, my jaw is a lever, my arms are levers, you know, my head is a lever when I move around. You know, your body, your heart is a pump. Uh, not simple machine, but I mean, everything in your body is a simple machine if it moves pretty much. Um, the uh, most interesting project I worked on, I worked for a company that manufactured bearings, ball bearings, you know, like that would be in the middle of a wheel. And um, I did a lot of cool stuff. I mean, I, 
I worked on some huge, huge bearings that were in steel mills that had to be able to take tremendous, tremendous loads of the steel, you know, rolled through the mill. That was pretty interesting. And it was just interesting to get to go to those kind of places and see a steel mill or see a paper mill or see some of the way food is packaged. Uh, another cool one I, I worked on was, um, and I just thought it was cool because I like them. So I uh, never have a frozen Snickers bar. So the company that made frozen Snickers bars, <clears throat> the m and Mars was having some failures in their packaging. They couldn't properly package the frozen Snickers bar. And I helped them solve that. And so we got the frozen Snickers bar. So that was kind of cool. Okay, I think um, I think we need to wrap up. There was, a, if um, Anna could take this very quickly, what is the coolest thing you have done, Anna? And then, um, and then we're gonna need to wrap up, I'm afraid. Yeah, I'll be really fast. So um, one of the big experiments that's currently being in the building phase here at Fermilab is kind of the same idea as Nova, where we have two detectors, but their far detector is gonna be way underground in an old gold mine in South Dakota. And a few years ago, I spent a summer down in that lab, in that mine. Um, and so that was just really cool being in a mine, but then you would step in and you'd be in a pristine lab space with that was like a clean room and everything. But it was also an old gold mine. So that's one of the coolest things I've done. Okay. Um, thank you very much, both Steve and Anna. Um, thank you all for um, participating, listening, learning, having a good time. And um, make sure you check out some of the other activities that we have here at the Fermi Lab Open House this week. Um, so thanks very much. And uh, maybe we'll see you next year too. <laughs>